Here's a problem for you. Let's say you're a statistician for a company specializing in diabetes treatment. You're part of the stats team for your company, and you're helping demonstrate that your company's new medication is going to help them. And you're in charge of demonstrating the value of your new company's medication. The lead statistician has already come up with the study design. Patients will be randomized to either placebo or treatment. The company will collect blood from each person every three months for a year to measure blood glucose. Many of the participants will miss this exact three-month timing, but the design is flexible enough to allow them to reschedule. With this design, you should be able to estimate the treatment effect, how much the treatment will change blood glucose relative to placebo. Your job is to develop a statistical model to estimate this treatment effect. With all this information in mind, what would you suggest? In this video, we'll answer this question and dive into one of the most powerful tools in statistics. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. Let's get started. As good statisticians, we should take stock of the particular characteristics of the data that will be produced. If the title of the video didn't already give it away, one of the distinguishing features of this design is that it'll produce longitudinal data. We'll be getting multiple measurements from each person in the study. I've talked about this in the previous two videos in this series, but I'll give it a quick rundown here. A standard assumption of many common statistical models is that our data is independent and identically distributed. Longitudinal data violates this assumption because data coming from the same person is likely to be similar to each other. That is, the data are likely to be correlated. We can hurt our chances of detecting a significant result if we ignore this correlation. Another element we have to contend with is the fact that people are going to shift their appointment times around. In a somewhat unethical ideal world, we would require or compel people to make all of their appointments exactly when the design specifies them to do so. But we're dealing with humans who are living actual human lives. They're probably a lot less inclined to worry about idealized math assumptions when they have bills and a full-time job to deal with. You might be wondering how rescheduled appointments are even relevant to the statistics. Let's say that we're in a hypothetical world where everyone in the study keeps their appointments exactly when we schedule them. So this means five observations per person. With correlated data, we have this notion of a correlation or covariance matrix, which I'll denote as capital sigma. This matrix numerically describes how similar multiple observations from the same person are. The rows and columns correspond to the observations taken throughout the study. The off-diagonal elements represent how similar or correlated two observations from the same person are. For instance, this element in the matrix corresponds to a correlation between the baseline observation and three-month observation. This is the correlation matrix you would get in this perfect world where we gather data from everyone at the exact same time points. We would refer to this data set as balanced. Let's see what happens when just one person schedules their appointment at month four instead of month three. The correlation matrix has to account for all the time points that we have. So instead of five, we have a total of six time points which results in a six by six correlation matrix. And there's a bevy of problems that come with this. The models from the first two videos in this series, the GLS and the GEE, require us to estimate all the parameters in this matrix. In a five by five matrix, there are five variance parameters in the diagonals and 10 correlation parameters to estimate. And this jumps to six and 15 respectively when we consider a six by six matrix. And we've only considered the case where just one extra time point when each person starts to get their own unique time points, you're going to get a very complicated correlation matrix. This results in a lot of missing data for each time point, resulting in what we call an unbalanced data set. I use this example to highlight how statistical models can clash with the reality of people just living their lives. Something as banal as a missed appointment can complicate the analysis. So we need an approach that will let us estimate the treatment effect while giving us a way to sidestep our unbalanced data problem. This brings us to the seminal paper by Nan Laird and James Ware, which introduced the random effects model. This model goes by a lot of other names, but I'm going to call it the mixed effects model. Let's start with a simple model and build up to it. In our example, we typically use a linear regression to investigate the relationship between a continuous outcome y and some independent variable x, the treatment. In this model, we care about the distribution of the outcome, conditioned on a specific x value. We usually assign the reference group as x equal to zero, so the outcome will have a particular distribution centered around beta zero. In our example, this would be the blood glucose distribution for the placebo group, and beta zero would represent the average value we'd see. When we consider the treatment group, we're considering the case that x equals one. 
If y doesn't have a relationship with x, then the two conditional distributions should look the same. But if it does have a relationship, then we'll see this as a shift in the distribution. More specifically, the mean of the treatment group will be shifted by beta 1, and we're usually interested in checking if it's distinguishably different from 0. Under the linear regression model, beta 1 captures the treatment effect for this population as a whole. We can give a similar population level interpretation to beta 0. The mixed effects model has a similar structure to the linear regression model, but allows for extra flexibility that lets us capture person-specific effects. We can create lots of different mixed effects models, but we'll focus on two simple cases, since they're the most commonly used ones we'd see. Sometimes, expert information or background knowledge will tell us that there is considerable heterogeneity in a population. For example, this would mean that people have varying average levels of blood glucose under placebo. Under linear regression, we would be ignoring all of these person-level differences since we're just using a single parameter to capture this average. But what if we allowed everyone to have a slightly different average outcome? What would that look like? There's several ways to do this, but the way that mixed effects models do that is through person-specific deviations or differences from this overall beta zero. Person one may be slightly under this overall beta zero, while person two may be much higher. Each person in the data will be given their own intercept, so to speak. In the model equation, we depict this with an extra person-specific term, little bi, where this little subscript indicates that person i gets their own deviation from beta zero. This is what we call a random intercept model. This bi is what we call a random effect. I'll talk about this soon, but just think of anything that's a random effect as a person-specific deviation. Other times we may have reason to believe that the treatment effect will also slightly differ among individuals. In this case, we can add another subject specific term, but for beta 1. Likewise, this model is a random intercept and slope model, since both the intercept and the slope have person specific deviations. In this model, beta 0 and beta 1 are what we call fixed effects. Unlike the random slope and intercept, these parameters are not pegged to any specific person. You can think of beta 1 as a change that everyone in the group experiences due to treatment, and a random slope as the additional change that a specific person experiences. Together, fixed and random effects are mixed effects, hence the name of the model. For simplicity, we'll use the random intercept model as a point for more discussion. In the random intercept model, we allow each person to have a slightly different mean outcome if it had been on placebo. We also place some structure on all of these person-specific deviations. These deviations are assumed to come from a normal distribution. The deviations have an average of zero, which means they're not systematically higher or lower than beta zero. And they have their own specific variance, which I'll label sigma squared b. When this variance is low, everyone's personal intercept will look very similar to the overall beta zero. Conversely, when it's high, there will be more heterogeneity. In theory, the distribution of these random intercepts can be more general, but practically speaking, it's almost always a normal distribution. If we were to consider a random intercept and slope model, we'd have a bivariate normal distribution with its own 2x2 two two covariance matrix. Because the random effects themselves have a distribution, mixed effects models are sometimes referred to as hierarchical models. There are some other assumptions made by mixed effects models, but I'm just going to list them here for brevity. When I first learned about mixed effects models, I was a little confused. I was told that it was a solution for correlated data, but it wasn't really clear to me how adding a random intercept or slope accomplished this. Unlike the GLS or GEE model, which explicitly modeled the correlation, the mixed effect model handles correlation in a more subtle way. Here's a standard linear regression next to a random intercept model. You can see that they're almost the same besides the addition of the random intercept. Before, we looked at it as a person-specific intercept but we can also view it as an extra source of noise. If we just group the random intercept and within person noise together, then the two models will look the same. This breakdown of the noise may seem simple, but it gives us an interesting property. The addition of the random effect increases the variance of the combined noise. No surprise there. There's two terms, so two sources of variance. But it also creates a covariance between any two observations coming from the same person. So including a person-specific random effect creates within subject correlation. Correlation is implied by the random effects. Now that you know about the mixed effects model, we can finally apply it to our problem at the start of the video. Since we're looking at the effect of the treatment over time, we need to incorporate time as a covariate in the model. 
In the GLS video, we use time as a categorical variable, but for this video, we'll choose to do it as a continuous one. To understand the effect of treatment over time, we can use a model that looks at the interaction between treatment and this time variable. To account for correlation in the data, we'll incorporate a random intercept. You might be able to make a case for including a random slope, but a random intercept model is probably the most practical choice. The parameter we're interested in is the one associated with the interaction term. If this were significantly different from zero, then this signals that the treatment is causing some extra change over time, hopefully a beneficial one. This type of model is so common in longitudinal data analysis that it's been given a special name, Mixed Models for Repeated Measures, or MMRM. I only considered continuous outcomes here, but random effects models can easily account for binary or count outcomes as well. The standard model for non-continuous outcomes is the Generalized Linear Model, or GLM. By adding random effects to the GLM, we get a Generalized Linear Mixed Effects Model, or GLMM. Mixed effects models are extremely powerful tools. Their use goes way beyond longitudinal data, and they're an invaluable model in both academia and industry. The models are so important to science overall that Nan Laird was awarded the 2021 International Prize in Statistics for her mixed effects paper. This is one of the highest honors in the field of statistics, on par with the prestige earned by the Nobel Prize. I hope that you enjoyed this three-part series on longitudinal data analysis. I don't really like doing series overall, but I'm glad I could finally get this done. It actually marks the end of required courses for biostatistics masters and PhD students. If you enjoyed this video, I hope that you'll subscribe to the channel for more content like this. You can get notified directly about new videos and get extra content by signing up for the channel newsletter. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.